Tassa, Namatassa, Bhagavato, Arahato, Sama, Sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So we are starting an adventure here. And I, when I got here, uh, they had ordered a book that actually I think that Bhikkhu Bodhi once wrote this before uh, in 2016, I think. And then it has been sort of a rebirth for this book uh, that it is coming to be sold more often now. And um, I don't know if you can see, let me see if I can do this. Oh, this is one of these deals where it's not going to let you see it. Wait, I changed this a moment. Let's see if I can change this. Um, and to make it, mm, so there's none here for a minute. See what it looks like in here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I have a big painting behind me. Um, the into modern art here in the Northland. <laughs> okay, so when I show you this book, this is called A Social and Communal Harmony. It is a small book, very small compared to the other ones, but uh, Bhante uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, he wrote this book. And this is an anthology of discourses from the Pali Canon, which he edited and introduced in 2016. And this is a good one if we are coaching, if we are counseling, if we are talking to groups about how things are going and everything. This is a pretty good book to draw information from. I'm going to give myself a little background here again. Oops, let's try. Mm going here. How's that? Let me make it a uh, mirror here. Well, that doesn't like it, so we'll do it the other way. <laughs> there. Okay. Um, I think this is really good because I was looking at it this morning, and it has sections in it for uh, right understanding, personal training, Dealing with anger, proper speech, good friendship, one's own good and the good of others, intentional community, disputes, settling of disputes, and the establishment of an equitable society. It's broken down into 10 sections, little sections, not giant ones. We are going to look today at a section that has to do with personal training. And we're going to look at um, a section four specifically. I will tell you what's in here, but uh, we're going to look specifically at loving kindness and compassion and the benefits of <clears throat> using uh, the loving kindness and compassion for your effort to wake up to become enlightened. So <clears throat> I have a really crack ever since they did a test on me. I have a crack in my throat, so I keep, you have to excuse me. Okay. So in here, it's talking into personal training about um, subtitles of generosity, and then uh, a superior person's gifts and the gift of food and the gift of um, Dhamma, talking about gifting, then it has a section on virtu virtuous behavior, and it has several pieces in that. And then from there, it goes to um, removing of defilements of the mind in the third one. And that actually uses suttas that I use when I'm teaching you a lot. It has uh, two kinds of thoughts, the defilements of the mind, and then the effacement. And we talk about those suttas ourselves. Then it goes into loving kindness. And I wanted to bring this up and I wanted to get some feedback from, we should have really announced this earlier, but I was on a very, very long flight and pretty tired today. But so loving kindness and compassion, this is what I'm going to get into with you. 
in a few of the small suttas, small pieces that he brought out about this and talking to you about the benefit uh, and having you talk to me a little bit about the benefit that you reflect from using uh, the, the uh, Brahma Viharas in the four divine abodes in practicing as the basis for your way to reach a, an opening in the mind. Okay, and I want to, um, just one second. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the first one we're going to talk about is the, the four divine abodes. And this one is taken from Majima Nikaya number 99. Okay. And that sutta is uh, talking about the benefits of the divine abodes. The Buddha told the young Brahmin Subha, here a monk would dwell pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third direction, likewise, the fourth. So above, below, around and everywhere. This is how we're showing you uh, the use of the six directions. He dwells pervading to all encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, without ill will. And when the liberation of mind by loving kindness is developed in this way, no limiting karma remains. So it's taking you completely through, is what's telling you. None persists there. This is the phrase you see a lot of times in the suttas, you see remainderless fading away and cessation of. That's what it means. The karma um, developed in a way that no limiting karma, uh, karma pala, the results of your the fruit of your karma, remains there. None persists there at all. Just as a vigorous trumpeter could make himself heard without difficulty in the four quarters, so too <clears throat> when the liberation of mind by loving kindness is developed in this way, no limiting karma remains there. None persists there. And this is the path to the company of Brahma. And that takes you all the way through to the company of Brahma. Now, again, a monk dwells pervading one quarter of the mind, imbued with loving kindness, likewise the second and all six directions. And then he does this imbued with altruistic joy all to all of the directions and with a mind imbued with equanimity. Likewise, he goes to the second direction, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above, below, around, and everywhere. In every way, he dwells pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, without ill will. When the liberation of mind by equanimity is developed in this way, no limiting action remains there. None persists there, just as a vigorous trumpeter could make himself heard without difficulty in the four quarters. So too, when the liberation of mind by equanimity is developed in this way, no limiting action remains there. None persists. When he says that this goes to the company of Brahma, this is when the person reached Arahatship to go into the company of Brahma and fruition is made from that place after that. So when you're saying the blessing at the end of each of our classes, you are saying um, 
you know, devas and nagas of mighty power, when you're talking that way, you're talking about even that location with the Brahma, the same thing. So this is uh, Majima Nakaya number 99. Now let's look at another small sutta. Number two, loving kindness shines like the moon. Monks, whatever ground there are for making merit productive of a future birth, these do not equal a 16th part of the liberation of your mind by loving kindness. This is how important loving kindness is. So you make you wonder when you listen to that statement, it makes you wonder how could it fall to the level of a cherry on top of a cake? Oh my gosh, <laughs> how could it be left behind as just a decoration today instead of how important it was? Because we are not reading these. We are not going by this. We're only going to depend on what we find in a main commentary as the directive. So if it isn't there, then it's going to diminish. The liberation of mind by loving kindness surpasses others and shines forth bright and brilliant as a path. Just as the radiance of all the stars does not equal a 16th part of the moon's radiance, but the moon's radiance surpasses them by and shines forth bright and brilliant, even so, whatever grounds there are for making merit productive of a future birth, these do not equal a 16th part of the liberation of mind by loving kindness. The liberation of mind by loving kindness surpasses them and shines forth bright and brilliant. Just as in the last month of the rainy season, in the autumn, when the sky is clear and free of clouds, the sun on ascending dispels the darkness of space and shines forth bright and brilliant. Even so, whatever grounds there are for making merit productive of a future birth, these do not equal a 16th part of the liberation of mind by loving kindness. The liberation of mind by loving kindness surpasses them and shines forth bright and brilliant. And just as in the night, at the moment of dawn, the morning star shines forth bright and brilliant, even so, whatever grounds there are for making merit productive of a future birth, these do not equal a 16th part of the liberation of mind by loving kindness. The liberation of mind by loving kindness surpasses them by and shines forth bright and brilliant. This is coming to you from the Itivitaka, the Itivitaka in section 27. It's an additional book to the five. Uh, the four Nikayas that we basically use. It's probably, I think it's part of the Kandaka, okay, the fifth book of the, um, the, the uh, basket. Number three, the benefits of loving kindness. Monks, when the liberation of mind by loving kindness has been pursued, developed and cultivated, made into a vehicle and a basis and carried out, consolidated and properly undertaken, 11 benefits are to be expected. What are these 11 benefits we hear about? Number one, one sleeps well. Number two, one awakens happily. Number three, one does not have bad dreams. Number four, one is pleasing to human beings. And number five, one is pleasing to any spirits. Number six, deities will protect one. Number seven, 
Fire, poison, and weapons do not injure one as a cause of death is what this means. Very likely this is something that will not cause your death in the process of your life. Number eight, one's mind quickly becomes concentrated, meaning a profitable level of concentration or collectedness of mind. Number nine, one's facial complexion is serene. Number 10, one dies unconfused. And 11, if one does not penetrate further, if one fares on, one will then fare on to the Brahma world. When monks, the liberation of the mind by loving kindness has been repeatedly pursued, developed, cultivated, made a vehicle and a basis, carried out correctly, consolidated, properly undertaken. These 11 benefits are to be expected. You can find this in the Anguttara Nikaya, book of 11, uh, book of the 11s in Sutta number 15. Okay. The next little one that comes, he did a great job at collecting these. The next one is called, Still There Are More Benefits. Monks, if someone were to give away a hundred pots of food, as charity in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. And if someone were to develop a mind of loving kindness, even for the time it takes to pull a cow's udder, means to milk a cow, <laughs> just once, just one time, okay? Either in the morning, at noon, or in the evening, this would be more fruitful than the former. Therefore, monks, you should train yourselves. We will develop and cultivate the liberation of mind by loving kindness. Make it our vehicle. Make it our basis. Stabilize it. Exercise ourselves in it. Fully perfect it. Thus, you should train yourselves. Let's look at that sentence again. Liberation of mind by loving kindness. Make it your primary vehicle, not mixing it up with other practices, but try it for a month or two, just as your primary vehicle. Make it our basis, basis for understanding, for comprehending the Dhamma through the, pers the, the perspective that occurs when you are practicing loving kindness. Stabilize it, meaning so that you can do it very, very easily. Exercise ourselves in it. Use it all the time. Take it in your pocket. Keep it in your buttonhole. As soon as something happens, let it come out and you need to practice it whenever any confrontations or anything happen and fully perfect it. Thus, should you train yourselves. And this comes from the Samyutta Nikaya, book 20. Number four is the sutta. That's where this one comes from. So he's telling you, these are benefits that come out of this, but if you use it fully as your main practice, doesn't mean you can't use breathing meditation to just calm down instantly for that reason, to calm down very quickly if you're an experienced breathing meditator. But when you are practicing with metta as your primary practice, you should have that in your mind, focus, breathing, life, everything, living every day, part of your life. In all your interactions should come the solution forth from your practice of the loving kindness. And remember the loving kindness rolls over into the compassion, which turns over into the mudita, which then turns into a very strong, stable equanimity. Again, that one's in book number 20, Sutta number four, Samyutta Nikaya. The fifth one is loving kindness and right mindfulness, the fifth point. I will protect myself. 
Thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. The establishments of your observation throughout the day, your mindfulness. I will protect others. Thus should the establishments of this observation be practiced. Protecting oneself, one protects others. Protecting others, one protects oneself. Always remember that. Protecting oneself. One protects others. Protecting others. One protects oneself. And how is it, monks, that by protecting oneself, one protects others? By the pursuit, development, and cultivation of the four establishments of mindfulness. Those four establishments are loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. It is in such a way that by protecting oneself that way, one protects others. And how is it, monks, that by protecting others, one protects oneself? By patience, harmlessness, loving kindness, and sympathy. It is in such a way that by protecting others, one protects one's self. I will protect myself. Thus should the establishments of mindfulness be protected. I will protect others. Thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. Protecting oneself, one protects others. Protecting others, one protects oneself. You find this in the Samyutta Nikaya, book number 47. Section, this sutta number is 19. The sixth and last point is the destruction of the influxes, which basically means those things which are coming in to disturb you. The Venerable Ananda is speaking to the householder named Dasama. Again, householder, a monk dwells pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise, the second quarter, likewise, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter. Thus above, below, across, and everywhere, in every way, he dwells pervading the entire world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, vast, exalted, measureless, without enmity, without ill will. He considers this and understands it thus. This liberation of mind by loving kindness is constructed and produced by volition, by your personal will, your personal will. But whatever is constructed and produced by volition is impermanent, subject to cessation. If he is firm in this, he attains the destruction of the influxes. But if he does not attain the destruction of the influxes because of that attachment to the Dhamma, because of that delight in the Dhamma, then with the utter destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one of the spontaneous birth due to attain final Nibbana there without ever returning from that world. So it means basically you've gone on to Anagami or you're going to go as far as um, you are not going to come back to this world, right? You will go with one more intention of reaching Nibbana at the end. And then this one is Majima Nikai number 52 for verification. It also appears again in the Anguttara Nikaya book of 11s in Sutta number 16. It appears in two other locations as well. I'm not familiar with those, those and pronounce those um, abbreviations. Just one second. Okay, middle length discourses of the Buddha. MLDB is for middle length 
discourses of the Buddha. Okay. Which is a separate book from Majima Nikaya. Okay. And the NDB, the NDB, it's a new one for me too, Numerical Discourses of the Buddha. So basically, Numerical Discourses of the Buddha is an additional uh, book to the Anguttara Nikaya, which is set up as numerical discourses. So that will be another way of finding. So if you do go to those two references, the MLDB is 456 and the NDB is 1575 if you go out. I'm gonna throw this open to you uh, and would like to know from you all, if you can talk a little bit to me, how are the, uh, what are the benefits of practicing uh, the loving kindness as you're using it? Are you using it in life? Are you carrying it with you? Do you understand the importance of this, the importance of carrying it with you and using it all the time? is going back to the um, going back to the neurocognitive research they're doing with the brain and understanding very clearly we can retrain our brain and habitual behavioral tendencies at any age we are what does that mean it means you're not stuck you are not stuck okay nobody can say i'm stuck i can't change anymore I really like this. I knew people at one point who believed without a shadow of a doubt, once you're an adult, you cannot change. There is no way you can change. Well, you can change. It's just going to take you a little bit more work and concentration of understanding consistency. We shouldn't say the concentration as much as the persistence and consistency of practicing doing this with your brain, because how does the brain work? The brain learns how to change simply by repetition. Repetition teaching again and again, the exact same way. And this is if you are one of the ones that's looking at teaching or anything like that and sharing this with other people, this is where we really have to remember that it's not important for you uh, in this unless to change the way you're saying this to the student. Don't keep changing the way you're saying it. I know personally, there's a big urge to do that. <laughs> and you really want to try to reach the student to get them to understand, don't do this. And then you want to say it another way and another way and another way. And it's not just, uh, you're, you're really trying to reach out to the student and get them to understand precisely what you want them to do repeatedly again and again and again to change the habitual tendency of the behavior pattern in the brain. But when people see you doing that kind of thing, they think immediately, ah, this person wants to make this their own way of saying, their own way of teaching. But you stop for a minute here, okay, just for a minute. <laughs> you have somebody who is teaching this stuff for 45 years. And he's telling you this is precisely how to say it. It's how it worked with thousands of people. And he's telling you exactly what to say. It's a good idea to keep going and understand saying it the same way again and again till the student comes to you at the door one day and they knock and you say, yeah, how's it going? <laughs> and the student says, you know, and they repeat to you just what you said to them the same way. And you're there, aha, uh -huh, you got it. Yeah, your brain is going to change now. That's how your brain changes. Brain communication between uh, me communicating to my brain is different than me communicating with you. It's a different form of communication. It has to be a constant tap, 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 tap in order to change. And the older you get, the longer we have to tap, okay, to do this. But, the, but the, the most important thing you face today is teaching, having the opportunity to teach a group of people and to teach them in a retreat setting or in a, you know, a four-day workshop or something like that. It's super important that you keep saying this the same way every single time so that they can go and remember it that way. You only have one shot to do that. Why is it so important? Because ingrained in most people is 
this is a retreat. We came to do this. Now we're going to go back home and we're going to go back in life. And what we face is when you go back into life, that's life. And we just try to go through it, but we don't keep practicing. So we're teaching you, we need to be sure we tell people this at the very beginning of the retreat. We're teaching you something to put in your pocket and to store in your buttonhole right here so that it's right with you all the time. And somebody confronts you, somebody says some snide remark to you, somebody tries to get you upset or they get angry at you, you know what to do. You know what to do. You just smile and you let go, relax smile and come back into it and just let it go. Yeah, you just let it go. So let me hear from you all. What do you think about this? The value of the Brahma Viharas in taking you to the main attraction, which is getting to a point where you can experience rebooting your mind, opening it up and seeing what it's like when it operates without any pressure on it. What do you think about that? Paul, are you using this? <laughs> are you using it in life? Ah, I see you. Hello, Sister Kima. Um, my first thoughts on this is the, the real beauty of the loving kindness is that um, it works with softness. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the response we need in daily life. Uh, the temptation always with things that occur in daily life is to respond with tension. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the teaching is really, really helpful because <laughs> it, it shows you and demonstrates how to work with um, the release of tension, how to work uh, with whatever comes up in the mind, um, in the opposite way to what would be instinctive. Um, and then the instinctive thing is to, to battle and to um, uh, kind of control the situation back to what you want. Personal uh, control. Mm -hmm. and, and the whole of the teaching works in a, with a completely different premise. Um, and the premise, that, as far as I understand it, is that you know, when, you, when you're met with challenge, what you need mm -hmm. to do is to create more space and more softness so that you can see the subtlety of the tension. Right. And so it gives you that little tiny space to decide where yeah. your, your direction yeah. is going to go. And, and this is a completely different neural pathway to, to what we're familiar with. Um, and what it does, and if you, and if you also embody the, the loving kindness itself, um, so that not only are you creating that space for, you, for yourself, but if you then revert to the loving kindness and put a little bit of loving kindness into the situation, what that seems to do is to create space for others to um, rebalance, not necessarily immediately, but what, you, what I find in my experience is that um, it creates that um, reflective space. So then people have come back uh, with a reassessment of where of what the situation is, rather than from an, in, an, an entrenched view, for instance. That's really good. It's a really, really good point. Um, they need this space to, to um, just catch themselves and realize what's happening and then uh, have a reply in alignment with the teaching. But it also mm -hmm. does give the other person that space. They have that also. And um, another thing is, is uh, the familiarity with where they're at. Um, people come to us a lot of times in our face about things. 
as if um, it's the only thing happening in the whole world is what's happening in their world. And they're angry because blah, 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 it has to do, the, it, everything's happening to them. When you you have a line of familiarity to, to, to touch base with them because most of what's happening of the drama, anywhere that the drama is happening, at any level of society, it's the same one. I mean, when I'm living in a very, um, um, low end of the um, of the society. I'm seeing all the same dramas as in the middle of the society, as the middle of the upper society and the king's palace. <laughs> the, the, the dramas are all the same. And so I have, I, I found in my business, um, you know, when I had my company, when my job ended up the last year, anything that happens with my girls having problem with an applicant, they send them across the hall to me to give all the gripes and problems to. And most of the time when they tell me what's happened for them that they're having a huge problem with, it's something that I faced too at some point in life. I see the familiarity lines, what I mean. The moment you can touch base with the other person, there's a familiarity line. You have an edge on, on, um, on helping that person because then they're, they're not, they're not going to feel alone and they're going to feel more easy about changing their actions. And have you found that also in interactions? Have you seen that too? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that uh, is very interesting is that uh, the teaching uh, applies to the human condition. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's not, it, 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 you're not dealing with people, people in silos of, of uh, just one particular cause or condition or, or circumstance they're dealing with. Um, and even if you can't necessarily identify with the detail of what they're going through, you certainly identify with the degree of distress and the impact that's happening and the knock on effect of that and the way to work with that, because the way to work with that is common to all of these. That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So in, in, in a way, what we're learning, uh, what I find that we're learning here is um, it's a question of control. Everybody's out to get control of their life. And what I found personally was that this is a, one of the strongest points of the teaching is teaching you that by understanding how everything works, you have a great deal, a big edge on other people who don't know how anything is working. And you're in a position of, of more control than you think you are. You get what I mean? But the, the but that control is about not trying to control the situation. That's right. Because you don't have to, because yeah. you understand and you but you can slip in little things, little pieces, you know, of the teaching to Absolutely. ease the situation because you really understand um, not just that this was a clock and it had a lot of pieces, but you've put it together now. So now mm -hmm. you can actually speak to the gears and the things turning, how they're operating. You can do that because you've been inside the clock and experienced actually putting one together. Now you can. Same thing with a bicycle, same thing with a tennis racket, same thing with, you know, uh, rollerblading <laughs> for miles. All of a sudden, once you get the edge of how the skate works or how the racket works or how the car works and stuff, you get an edge on things. Mm. So you don't have to be upset because you understand what's happening to the other person. Yeah. Yeah. And, and by extension, um, you see the invitation to become upset or engaged, and you can just allow that to, to pass by. You don't have to pick that one up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. Anything else? No, I think that's, uh, that was my, co <laughs> my comments. Yeah. The, 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 um, the subject they had for the monks speaking this week, which unfortunately I couldn't join, um, was why, why do we say the Buddha is great? And so when I heard that, and then I picked up this book when I arrived here, Pierre had this book on the table and I picked it up and I thought, oh, wow, I haven't seen this before. It's a tiny little book, but I think we should all have a copy of this book. I think it's really important. It's probably on Amazon, probably on Amazon. Yeah, it yeah, is. I bought it from the Swedish yeah. site, but it's probably on Amazon. Yeah. 
It's, yeah, uh, I, I, you know, it's probably, bought it, I bought it on Amazon. Good. <laughs> good, good. It's this on Amazon. So I'm sure they could get this one in India too, I'm sure. Yeah. And I think it's really worth getting this one because it's pretty simply designed. It's a lot cheaper than these as well. Yeah. Oh, it's a lot cheaper than there. Yeah. We need, we need to actually, we need to remember to put our word in over at, um, at the, uh, where the uh, Majima Nikai is published again. One year we put our word in very firmly. If you print any books uh, like upside down in part of the book or, <laughs> or you do something crazy, crazy happens, please send them to us for $10 a book and we'll take them. We did that one year and we actually got about 50 or 60 books that year. It was a long time back, but I think we should always submit ourselves for that because we 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 probably are one of the best seller selling units they have out here for the Majima Nikaya for the, the last 20 years we've been doing this you know and you've seen how it's increased with the, the sale I'm not saying we're the only ones but we are probably among the very few who will say the truth of it is that that has the whole entire teachings and start with this one, don't start in any other order, and then go through to the Samyutta Nikaya. And after that, uh, you can you you can keep the Digga Nikaya around. There's nothing wrong with keeping the Digga Nikaya around, uh, but it's only for reference to the Mahasatipatthana Sutta and Parinibbana Sutta. And I think there's. Uh, uh, Sigalavata Sutta, but you can find those online, you know, pretty easily. So, um, but then the Angutra Nikaya also is, is fun, but it is what it is, okay? And it basically was for people that really needed to make sure all the pieces were not lost. And so we're going to set them up in 12 books and we're going to do ones, twos, threes, you like that. But, um, but this is, the fact he pulled this out of, he used a couple different uh, sources. He has about 12 sources in this, I think, in the front. But he did such a nice job, didn't he, of, mm -hmm. of making it short so you could have a cup of tea and pick one up and then go play and think about it. And that is what we needed. We like that. Yeah. What, what I particularly like about it is the, the short uh, sections don't lose their context, where it's so easy yeah. to just lift a sentence out or mm -hmm. a paragraph out. And without the context, you can change the meaning. And I really appreciate Bikkhu Bodhi so much when he does this this way, because that is one of the problems for the younger monks who are trying to use the text, but they don't quite have enough of it, you know, to, to bring the context into their talks. Okay. And so he's helping us a great deal by putting this sort of thing together. I think it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this is... Uh, get this book today. <laughs> this is my get this book today by Bigger Bodhi because I'm always, uh, you know, trying to help along this uh, wonderful thing that he's been doing for so many years. Yeah. Does anybody else have a comment on on understanding about the importance of the uh, the um, Brahma Viharas, the four of them, as far as how it's helping you change. Does anybody have any questions about this? I must have a really smart class, you know. <laughs> You're not all here today, but you did pretty well. You probably thought, some of them probably thought I vanished, but I didn't vanish. I just flew for a long time. <laughs> and then when I got here to take a rest, I didn't realize something. I hadn't been here before and it doesn't get dark here. <laughs> You know, it's like um, I was asking them about England. I wanted to ask you how long does what when is when is uh, sunset for you there in England? Well, what sunset's time? Get, getting pretty close to about uh, half past eight, nine o'clock, and sunrise okay. is at probably about five o'clock. Yeah, see, so that's it doesn't really it doesn't really get dark until about ten, and uh, and it's getting light around about. Well, the good thing was they don't just have, um, you know, they don't just have curtains, but they have shades on all the windows. And so we just lock down and go to sleep anytime. <laughs> and that's it, you know. So this is very good. Interesting. Okay. So are we, we're kind of, this is a fizzle time. Let's see, what else can we talk about here? Well, okay. Does anybody have any more questions before I jump?
they all want to see me jump. Woo! There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the Mashima Nikai has always been an, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the Brahma Viharas have always been an issue for me uh, because of course we, we grew up on them with Bhante Vimala Ramsey. We, we trained with these uh, and some of us that came in with him may have used the breathing meditation for anywhere from two to four weeks before we went into the Brahma Viharas. But really, um, he looked at this and also, uh, also Dr. Punaji told me in 2000, this was that, you know, the, that the breathing meditation was in, uh, the strongest point of it was to settle you down immediately. So settle you down just immediately stop and breathe and use your breath and that way cycle yourself down very very quickly to a calm state then shift over uh, to whatever you're going to practice but in the end I guess before he died he was really teaching more breath than he was teaching um, Brahma Viharas but you can you can follow that tract but you should the biggest part of following the track of breath uh, if you're not going to be following Brahma Viharas, is to pick up on the reality of the value of understanding right effort has four steps. And right effort, you know, the Samoyama has drifted and the steps in the breathing meditation itself of the, the, um, the two sections of tranquilizing the bodily formation and then tranquilizing the mental formation have been cut out of the emphasis in, in the instructions. And that's what's been holding people back from progressing and understanding. And so then you can see down the line how that sort of developed into, it could take years and years and years to get to the first jhana. And then when you got to the first jhana saying, maybe we should stay here for a year. Ooh, you know, And the idea of missing the natural flow of meeting something new. For instance, um, well, I could take you through any number of examples, but let's meet a sailboat. We're gonna teach you to sail. And we would spend time on the dock first, learning all the knots. And then we would learn about the parts of the boat and have to take a little quiz on the parts of the boat. Then we would get in the boat and then we would start to use the different parts with our instructor, but we wouldn't be allowed to go out and sail by ourselves, okay? Until we, we got to the point where we should start to do attack and, and just go straight and navigate straight and then turn around this way and catch the wind and go back. Or how can we learn how to get across the lake if the wind is against us and then learn the different parts of that? So we can take anything, we can take any sport and we can apply this to how to train. But then let's go one step back. You're not a sports person, but you have a new neighbor and the neighbor is next door. So you just want to meet and greet Sam Jones next door. And so you do. And then you might want to go to work and Sarah might want to have tea with Jane Jones and go next door and have tea and, and get to know them a little bit. And the next thing you know, you might wanna have a picnic and then you might get to really know them closer and closer and closer. This is the normal progression of anything we discover as human beings. So why did it get, uh, why did it suddenly change and move away? Um, I'm not sure, I haven't figured it out quite yet, but I'm still looking. But uh, why did it really change the way we're going to go after learning Buddhism? But when we go back into, it's important to get to know the people who were involved in the story and where they came from and where they were introduced to things. I think we have some recordings. I think I did a series on several of the people in um, the Buddha and his, um, the Buddha and what? The Buddha and his. Yeah, the Buddha and his teachings. We went, we took the green book, and that's my favorite book, the Buddha and his teachings, which is a free book. You can get it online. It's a, um, it's one of the things that's connected with uh, Keshri Dhammananda, I think. And you go and you examine that to get to know who all these people are, you know, in the stories. Who was Sariputta and who was Mogalana? Did they know each other before they were Sariputta and Mogalana? How did that all work? 
And how many Kasapas were there? <laughs> There's five Kasapas, you know, five different Kasapa brothers floating around in there. And what were their parts? And what was important about Anuruddha? And uh, how about uh, Kimberly and um, Kohita and, and um, Kandanya? And these, what, what were the parts that they played in the importance of teaching? You can find these in the suttas. But when you leave the suttas, these, you try to go outside of this and, and you end up not just relying on just per one particular commentary or a group of commentaries, but you're only relying on those folks who are far away from the beginning and un understanding what was going on for these people and how their little jobs in the uh, structure of the meditation school, as I call it, was a meditation school that was moving around India systematically uh, on foot as part, you know, well, maybe in a, you know, cart with bulls pulling it, you know, a couple of times that works. It's very slow, but it works, <laughs> you know, and going from place to place and teaching. And then even, we even have the preservation of the structure of the school it, within the suttas texts. We can find the description of how the school was organized and when the students could talk to each other, that's interesting. Uh, there was actually a time they could talk to each other. Yes, there was a time they could talk to each other. Well, who would they talk to? And it makes perfect sense. Sodapanas would talk to Sodapanas. Those trying to get to be Sodapanas would try to talk to others who were trying to get to the Sodapana. And when you're Sodapanas, you're talking to a group of people who are trying to get to Sodapana and fruition, that group, okay? And so why was that? And it, it points to it. These are things that are pointed to, but not discussed greatly, but they are pointed to. And that's the part that you need to pick up on as you get to be friends with the text and easy reading with it, you get used to it. Then you get curious. It's kind of like Shakespeare. Shakespeare is so difficult to read. Some people want to run away. You know? But if you get to learn to read Shakespeare, you get to the understanding of what these words mean and everything. You get to know the characters really well. I didn't do it that much. I regret that now. But I have the opportunity to do this with the monks that were there in the time of the Buddha. So these people all had, they had stories. They had uh, things that were important that they were teaching and ways that they were teaching. And uh, that's what we pick up on when we turn ourselves completely over to the suttas first. And the reason it was important for them to be talking to the same kind of person is the confidence. We don't hear about confidence that openly, but we see it coming up. We gain a time where you gained confidence. You went to something happened and you gained confidence. If you look closely at where you gained confidence is mentioned, I think there's one spot in the Anupada Sutta where it's mentioned. And we stopped Bhandi and we said, what, is, what does this mean? What, how? And then he started to tell us a little bit about the organization of the school and talk about it a little bit. I wish he had done more of that because that was in the days before we were recording anything that we were sitting there listening to these things every night. And um, so many things that he told us about uh, the things that would be hard for you to pick up on unless you were there for a number of years exposed to the texts. Now, exposed to the text is one thing, we shouldn't be abandoning the commentaries. I would say it right up front. We should be putting them in their place. That's all. We should be making sure they stay in the reference side of things and not in primary source point side because they can define things properly and they can often show you little things that you want to explain. The joy was an example. If you go back and listen to Bhante's descriptions of five kinds of joy, it's not in the texts. It happens in the commentary, but it clarifies precisely the five kinds of joy, okay? So that you begin to relate to it. And that's the way you need to be speaking from the heart. 
this is one of the things. Having somebody say, the teacher says that when we teach, we should teach from the heart, does not mean we should reinvent the Dhamma and just teach it in our own words. To my way of thinking, this is an IMHO, if you know what that means, in my humble opinion over the years, to speak from the heart is to bring you the simile of the car when I'm talking about the precepts and to bring other similes that make sense to you when you don't know what an oil lamp was, okay? And to give you different similes that work in the day and time and country and culture that you're in. That's what saying from the heart means. Of course it means I'm talking about when I say teach from the heart, it's important to teach from the heart humbly and you really mean it and I'm doing this uh, with deep love and great respect as I'm teaching you that's from the heart but I'm saying don't go to the university for one year take poly and decide to do your own translation so that it matches your own experience don't do that <laughs> You know, because that can mess a lot of people up who are not going to have the same experience as you had or learn the same way you learned if you try to put that across to people. And that's very, that was, there's some unfortunate things going on out there on the internet because there's no, no police saying you can or can't do this. And sometimes we let things go by maybe that we shouldn't, but we don't have any way to stop them. Yeah. So you use common sense and the best way in this teaching, because for us, for I'm saying for us in our school, this is a working, living example of the Dhamma to be used all the time in life. And so the important pieces we find as examples and share with each other are the pieces where you can say it a particular way and Sarah gets it perfectly and she can see it perfectly when I show her. And when I can feel her reaction, a lot of the way Bhante was teaching was that way. And when he said it very simply and said it according to the text and just simply slightly expounded on it. So what, what did we do? How did we expound? What exactly did we expound? We expounded this. This is what we expounded. You can't see it. There he is, Oxford Thesaurus. And a lot of you out there think that you speak English very well and have the best sources, dictionaries in the world. But this little book will make you a 10 times over better English speaker than you ever were or ever were writing. If you get a thesaurus and start using it, you don't want, uh, there was a writer last year, I can't remember, it was, a. it's not science fiction, it's more like philosophy. He wrote a great big book and he liked the word stunning okay it was about synchronicity and and every single solitary thing that happened in that book it was stunning stunning and I'm wondering how many people in different languages knew what stunning was is it stunning the person did it hit him in the head and it stunned them or what was stunning and he never looked up to see what stunning was. I'm not sure if I can do it or not. I'm not sure if stunning will be in here. Let's just try because I used to play this game with my students and what does it mean to have some, oh, here you go. Now just listen at the variation of the word stunning that you could have used in your book. Impressive, imposing, remarkable, extraordinary, staggering. Incredible, amazing, astonishing, marvelous, splendid, mind-boggling, mind-blowing. You could have had a lot of fun, you know? but it was all just stunning, you see? And I never wanted to see the word stunning again after I actually read this like nine, seven or 900 page book. I never wanted to see the word stunning again. The second definition gets even more fun. Sensational, ravishing, dazzling, wonderful, magnificent, glorious, exquisite, impressive. That was a good one. Splendid. You see, beautiful, lovely. You, you see, 
Now, why did we have to say stunning? I, when I was finished the book, I thought, no, I don't have time. But the urge was to go back through and see whether I could highlight how many times the stunning, stunning was written through this book. <laughs> It's just your, anyway, it's not a critique here, so don't take me too seriously, but I just think that the sources are magical, you know, like you can't say relax, where do you see that it says relax, okay, all right, let's go to tranquilize, I think that one's in here, um, we go to tranquilize, and we see whether well, I was really allowed. Was I really allowed to say uh, that tr to tranquilize something is to relax it? I'm not. I think I had to go to a different one. Mm, I, I did. It was the big one. I don't have the big one with me. That when I say that, this is the this is the one you get to keep with you all the time. This one's got. 140,000 cinemas. That's a pretty good start. Okay, the bigger books, which we had five. And before we would change a word, just so you're aware, we took it seriously. We had to find the ones we thought were the most logical and we ran them by about three or four or five people. And then we took those words and we used them in front of at least a hundred people, like three retreats of 30 people each to see what would happen on their faces when we're using those words. Then we would decide this is gonna reach these group of people much better than uh, these other words. Now, an example was, um, what was the thing when we changed thinking and examining? Do you remember? What did we change it from? Um, where's the book? In this book, there was a, um, this was actually, and, and someone said, you can't change what Vicky Bodhi said. And I'm there, look, Vicky Bodhi's not here. He's not here. And he's not in front of these people. And he's not watching their faces when uh, using these words. A good one was extirpate. Okay, you show me how many people in the audience know what extirpate means. So I'll pay you a dime for each one. Okay. And finally, we just, he changed it in the books he wrote. Bonte changed it in the books he wrote. Put, removing something by the roots is the definition. Removing something by its roots. Like my mother used to get furious at me if I went out and said, I weeded the garden. Did you use the little machine? No. Why didn't you use the little machine? You didn't pull the weeds out by the roots. <laughs> you see? So they all came back. She was mad at me. Yeah. So when we look at when we look at this one uh, in in 111, okay, the word I'm thinking was um thinking and examining. I know it so well the way I do it. Um, okay, here we go. What is applied and sustained thought? Okay, now we, I used to watch the, the students, you know, 25, 30, 40 students in front of me, and they'd all be like, mm, you know, what is it? And then he started saying, thinking and examining thoughts. And everybody went, hmm, yeah. And you ask them in their interviews, do you know what that means? Yeah, they know exactly what it means. A thinking is a thought pops up. This is vitaka and vichara is examining. Vitaka, vichara, right? Okay. And so to get them to understand those two words, thinking and examining thoughts, bingo. And a story works perfect. But applied and sustained. Another thing about applied, where they were getting twisted up if you ask them, applied meant I applied something and a thought came up. Is it true? Whoops. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, uh, those sense doors experience outwardly and mind operates the same exact way and pattern in your dependent origination. So the thoughts that arise arise impersonally, the way the sight, sound, odor, flavor, and sensation arise impersonally. Do you see what happened here? But applied is like changing 
another word like formations to fabrications. And many people will go and sit there and immediately say, who fabricates? But there wasn't any who to fabricate, you see? And so formations arising could be accepted as impersonally occurring, but fabrications had to be someone fabricated. That was a, tie, a place where things got a little funny. That was with a different translation. But when we translate, if it works for us, does not necessarily mean that it works for the majority of people that we're presenting to. So as a teacher, we have to play around. And that's where you get to play around and test and find answers and share them. <laughs> share them with us. Let them know if you found one that really works well. That's why this thing is not something locked in stone and we cannot touch it or change anything. The master has spoken. Yeah. Uh, I think one, one of the things you're highlighting there um, is that quite a few of the translations, uh, the words chosen imply agency rather mm. than um, something happening as a natural consequence. Thinking occurs. It's not that we choose to think. Yeah. It's then mm. what we do about the thinking. Um, and we've talked about this on a, a previous session around um, uh, revulsion and disenchantment. Ah, uh, yeah. Revulsion has real energy about it. Disenchantment yeah, has a cooling about it. Yeah, the personal. The, cho the choice yeah. of word is very important, even though from a, a thesaurus point of view, it, it, it may have an equivalence. It doesn't have an, it, they're not identical. Well, see, when, when, you're, when you're speaking in the beginning, um, it's kind of uh, it's kind of like you're um, you're doing something very not not quite right if you're using revulsion with a person who's beginning, okay, just beginning to learn. Um, and this what where this came up for me about that was um, when you're using the idea of disgusting and revulsion and repugnant and things like this are hard words. You see, now there's nothing when you look at the sutta where it appears. A lot of times you're going to find that it was spoken to the monks. Okay. So, you know, they're not beginners and they're listening to this. That's fine. But we don't always identify that, do we? You don't always know what order all these suttas came and occurred in the Majjhima Nikaya. The reason I'm saying that is because if you do it with a beginner, they can go away and they can say, you know, and this is how it happened. Okay. Buddhism is one of the most pessimistic, sad religions I've ever encountered in my life. <laughs> I did it for a few months and I hate myself and I'm repugnant and repulsive and disgusting. I don't like my body. I don't like to dress up. I want to stay away from people. And this is a horrible, sad misunderstanding of this whole thing. However, if you're using those words with somebody who's been uh, working with the path or going down the path, they, they know what it means. You see what I'm saying? Just the way to introduce um, uh, to, to introduce disenchantment is not too rough, to, to emphasize a great deal, and there are suttas that only go as far as disenchantment, and I, I noticed this in some places, so that's fine, but to go as far as dispassion, <gasps> I don't want that to happen to me. Oh my gosh, you know, it reminds me of the man who was in the lobby. Who I said to him, now, when after the break, he's going to talk about um, Anatta. And the man looked at his friend and said, well, Harry, I have to go now. <laughs> Harry says, well, why do you have to leave? You were going to stay the whole night. We, why, why are you leaving? I can't stay here and listen to this talk, man talk about Anatta, the self, if there's no self. That's a horrible thing. After all, I've been trying for weeks to have a date with Norma at the office. And what will I do if I don't exist? <laughs> and he walked out. He walked out of the lobby of the temple and left because he was terrified of, of no self. Even a discussion about it was scaring him. And I, I'm not being funny. This, this, it was funny, but you know, but he didn't know it was funny. It wasn't funny at all to him. You see? So where did this whole thing come from when they had, I couldn't do it. I couldn't physically be there uh, because I was between plane and airport and Pierre and coming here when this 
discussion happened this time, the bi-weekly discussion, but the topic was, tell us why the Buddha is great. That was the subject. <laughs> and so I, I wrote a note to Bhante Kusala and I said, please, you know, include this when you mention it. But, oh my gosh, the door you open when you, uh, when you open that door, uh, you can hear some strange things come across <laughs> because um, some people are, are, are talking about uh, things that we should be emphasizing maybe the other side. I don't say don't talk about how many people are, are leaving and how many people are coming, but they only think you should talk about who's coming and not who's leaving. And somebody mentioned who was leaving and they didn't emphasize, they didn't explain any of it. And then I, I couldn't go to that one. I was kind of sad about that because I certainly would have had a few things to say about it. As if to say, you know, if you inter my question, I think uh, that got across in that one. I think I sent a message on the chat and I said, ask them, why are they leaving? How many of you asked them why they are leaving? That is the emphasis today in today's cultural setup in any country you are. Why would you leave a Buddhist temple? Why would you do that? And this is what the monks need to sit down and discuss openly before it's too late. And the reason you would leave is because of a lack of certain things. Find out what it is included in your temple. Rearrange your programs. Fulfill the void. Come on, you can do it. You don't know how to do it. Write me a note. I'll show you how to do it. You can do it. Is not reason for it. But... Um, we have to we have to look very carefully at this time. Uh, the value of the song, if it slips away, is only because it's standing on an island and not asking the congregation what it wants and needs that isn't quite there. This discussion needs to happen in modern times. Maybe it didn't have to happen in other times. I can agree with that. The structures were different. But right now, if you start interviewing people who might be considering leaving with their younger children and not staying, you need to understand why and consider how do we uh, look at this? What do we do to adjust ourselves? And there certainly are wonderful, wonderful adjustments. And you need to find out the truth about why is the Buddha great? Oh boy, I mean, I really wanted to be there. You know, it was like one of those things where I could have kept going and going and going and going on it. We should do one of these here. We should ask you all to come and tell us why is the Buddha great? And you should all come. We should make it a wide thing and see if we could get 50 people in here and just listen to people. You know, we're not, it, we want to know why you think it's great. But we, then we should have one and say, why would you ever consider leaving? Maybe we should do one of those and have it an open, open status too, to, to talk openly. Because I think it's the most powerful spiritual path group and organization I've ever been involved in, except that it's out of touch with the cultural and uh, the age it sits in and the cultural needs of people in different countries. That's the spot where there is a weak point. When you have a weak point in a system or in an industry or in a factory, you don't shut down the factory. <laughs> you don't cancel the business. You have a meeting with your employees. You figure out what's lacking and how you can fix the situation. Or you have a meeting with your congregation and they say, okay, the minister is fired. Let's get somebody else in here who knows what they're talking about and is sensitive to the needs of the congregation. No matter how you want to call them, they are your congregation. They are your support system. So I go even further than that and say, look, if you wanna be eating in 10 years, let's get busy and start talking about what needs to be examined. Now that I'm 73, I think I'm going to start talking a little bit more in the open about this because it's coming up. It's what, this is what's triggering me. I want you to understand this. I've been waiting 10 years for a Mahatera monk to shoot up a statement and say something like what we're talking about. 
and it happened. Now, that's our off. Sister Kame is coming out of the box. <laughs> in a nice way, because I don't see anything here that is not solvable. That's the thing. I do not. I see the most glorious, wonderful, compassionate, loving, and supportive kind of a spiritual walk anybody could imagine in this teaching. And I think that if we could just get over um, behaving like some other people are behaving where we say it the same way for seven generations and we could identify things are changing. After all, a Nietzsche is real, isn't it? If it's not, you need to point it out to me. But a Nietzsche is real. Everything is changing. If a Nietzsche is real, wake up. <laughs> you know, that's where that's what I'm talking about. It's one of the reasons you might understand that I stay a solitary. One of the reasons that I stay as a seminary that's very, very, very active. Okay. But this is one of the reasons because I could get, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be attached to, you know, 300 rules that say, don't ever talk about this. Don't ever bring it up. You could play that game for the last thousand years, but you can't play it now. You cannot play that card right now. And when I came into this in the very beginning, one of the things that was a deal is the Sangha, the concern for the song is at the very top of the list. And the teacher in this system is the Buddha himself. And my guide, my master guide was Bhante Vimala Ramsey, but he is not the master teacher the Buddha is. And when we teach what the Buddha taught, it has to be for the support and the growth and the security of the Sangha. That's my, that's how I was created. <laughs> and Buddy says, what have I created? <laughs> and here I am. So if you love Buddhism, you will question it. If you love it and want to remain supported by it, you will dive in and talk about it openly. And everyone who speaks will hear you. This is the divine way it should be without criticism and open consideration for everything you're saying and the good side of things. And the reason you're saying anything isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. And we need to hurry up and do it. The figure right now that I know about in Mumbai is 43 empty temples, 43, empty of Sangha. Basically there is banquet halls, nitpicking and poo poo, you know, discussions between people who say that they take care of those places. But only monks are there that come in to those places when there is a special holiday. Why? There are classrooms in those buildings. There's room for monks to live there. Why is it happening that way? And can they be turned over to people who want to do just monk functions and, and, and do they want to turn those buildings over for use, like for nuns to use and monks to use that are dedicated programs to the Dhamma? No, they want to hold on to control. Why? I don't know yet, but <laughs> I got a few more years. I might figure it out. So we're going to let you go. I, I'm going too far. I was only going to go to, I did pretty well. It's 4.30. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I hope it was interesting for you today. Um, and all things done in the joy of the Dhamma, all things for the support of the Dhamma, all things certainly for the support and uh, growth of the Sangha in a good way in a positive way and in an open-hearted and open-minded way for the best possible growth that can happen in this century so it keeps going that's what i want to see and i want to see everybody smiling so have a really good week let's say our prayer mm -hmm. may Please. suffering ones be suffering Suffer. free and, and the fear struck fearless yeah. be may, may the, the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief 
may all being share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. And may they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Ding, ding. Thank you, Sister Gita. <laughs> Thank you. My 